So let's get that going. So we're talking about FT8 and field day. So just a uh, little bit of an intro on uh, FT8. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Joe Taylor from Princeton. Uh, he was a physicist at Princeton. And by the way, he's a uh, Nobel laureate in physics. And uh, his work at the Green Bank uh, Observatory, uh, he's worked at the Green Bank Observatory, but um, his work there is what's led to a lot of what we're seeing here with the weak signal uh, contacts. Now, uh, when we talk weak signal, uh, that does not necessarily mean low power. I know there's uh, some misconceptions that we're talking low power here, but it's weak signal. I can tell you personally, there have been times where I have needed a full 1500 watts to get into Australia or somewhere in the Southeast Asia areas. And my signal report coming back from them was just above the noise floor. So sometimes it can take some juice to get there, but the idea is to be able to dig a signal out from the noise. So why do you want to use it for field day? You get two points for each contact. Uh, unlike uh, phone, uh, it's just like CW, you get two points. Uh, I think last year we came close to uh, matching CW for the number of points that were achieved. Uh, I will say that um, just in my personal experience, CW can go faster. They can take 30 seconds to do a contact. Whereas with FT8, you're usually going to take around a minute uh, to complete a contact. So what I wanted to do is give a little overview of here of what I use for FT8, of what I'm going to use for field day and FT8. Basically, three pieces of software. First one, WSJTX. You get that from the horse's mouth of uh, Joe Taylor. Uh, there's a link there. Uh, you can just download it and install it. It's good for Mac OS, Linux, and Windows. I also use JT Alert. Um, I do run on a Windows machine. I use JT Alert. And what this does, uh, what JT Alert's job is to do is to take the information from WSJTX and feed it into your logging software. And for logging, I use uh, N3FJP software. It's the common one that we all use at field day. If you don't have a license for it, it's nine bucks for field day in itself. Um, what you see that I'm going to present here, uh, you could substitute your own logging software for it, uh, or just not run any and just export the files from WSJTX uh, and just use those. But this is what I typically use. And so I just show you how we set them up. Um, so the other big thing to worry about is time. The time on your computer needs to be accurate. Uh, for, for operating systems such as Mac OS and Linux, this usually isn't too much of an issue uh, because they will get the time off of the internet. Uh, problem with Windows is that um, their NTP, the network time protocol system they use, has some drift problems. So what some people do is that they will figure out a different mechanism of getting time. For me, what I do is I use an actual, G I use a GPS, uh, plug it into the machine via USB, and then there's a nice little program there that I use that will take the GPS and sync the time. If you've got internet available, uh, you can use, um, the, like I said, Linux and Mac OS. They're okay with the standard servers that they hook up to. Uh, I usually change them over to the NIST servers. The information on how to do that is all out there on the web. And for Windows, uh, the gold standard among the FT8 people is to use the Meinberg NTP client. Uh, the download site for it is there. But the reason that you need time be accurate is because everybody's trying, everybody transmits and receives in 15 second chunks. And if you're too far off of that, 
you're not going to decode or they're not going to decode your transmits appropriately. You can generally get away with about a two second difference, but that is pushing the limit as what I have found. Um, most people, you want to be within about a second. So first piece of software I install is the logger. Um, you're all familiar with this, so you know what it looks like. Uh, what we'll do is we'll just go through the setup real quick of what I do um, for, uh, for this uh, logging software. Uh, for the rig interface, you're going to need to set, uh, what I do is take control of the rig away from N3, uh, the N3 logging software. I give it to WSJTX. So when you get into the um, rig interface, you want to set it to none. Um, It'll be happy with it. It'll get all the information that it needs from the um, FT8 software. The other thing that you need to do is to enable the, the application programming interface. So you select settings, go down to the bottom, uh, near the bottom, select that, and you'll get a window that looks like this. Make sure you select TCP AP, API enabled and make sure the port is 1100. That's critical. So now we move on to setting up WSJTX. Um, I'm just going to shorten my phrase on that to say JTX or TJX or whatever it is. Um, so I may intersperse those. This is what the screen kind of looks like when you've got it up and running. Uh, you have one main screen that it's showing you the decodes as well as uh, what's uh, for the entire band as well as for wherever your uh, receive frequency is set. And then you have a waterfall, uh, which gives you a nice view of what's going on on the band, where the gaps are that you can uh, transmit in and set your transmit and go from there. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So to set it up, um, go to file, select settings. And you'll get a window that pops up that looks like the one on the right. Fill in the appropriate information. You'll need the call. Uh, generally, the ones that I play with are um, you need to set your call, your grid, um, the, rest of the, the rest of the top uh, station details, their uh, defaults, and they're just fine. One of the other things that I will do is I will um, set blank uh, the blank line between decoding periods. You'll see that under display. I change my distance to miles. Uh, and you can play with any of those, see, set it up with the way that you like it. The other one that uh, you definitely want to hit is the double click on call sets transmit enable. So what happens is that when you see somebody that you want to talk to, uh, you double click on their uh, call sign, it'll automatically set up the outgoing message. And with the double click on, uh, on call sets transmit enable, it will automatically start transmitting. If this is not set, you'll double click it and it won't start transmitting until you hit the button that said enable transmit. So this is a little time saver. Just enable that and it'll help you out. The other one that I do is I disable transmit after sending 73. So what will happen is, is that as you cycle through, when you do a message, so what will happen is, is that if this is not set, it's going to automatically go to the next message, which is generally a CQ. You'll start calling CQ. <coughs> if you're running search and pounce, which I often do during field day, you're going to need that set. Um, so I just set it and leave that to d always disable my transmit after it sends the 73 message. And then when I want to start a new cycle, if I'm doing, if I'm doing a run where I'm CQing, I'll just hit enable transmit again. Let's see what else in the settings we have. Um, you need to set up your radio. Um, this is where I let WSJTX, um, do the handling of the radio. Uh, you'll need to set up whatever is necessary for your rig. 
Uh, I run an Elecraft, and it's actually running through a um, uh, one of Microham's little uh, boxes. So I have a serial port for cat uh, for cat control, as well as a different serial port to actually do hardware um, PTT. If you don't have that available, you can always do it via Vox or Cat. It's your choice. But once you get your cat control parameter set for ever how you're controlling the rig, then you can hit a button called test cat. What'll happen is if you get it right, it's gonna turn green. Yay. <laughs> so that means you have communication with your rig. That's a big critical step. The next thing you do wanna check is your PTT, whether you're doing Vox, CAT, or COM port, check it. And what you do is you just hit that button. Now that button doesn't become enabled until test CAT is passed. So once that hits, then what you do is that you'll hit that. It'll actually turn red while it's transmitting. Uh, I didn't show that here, but it'll turn red. Just hit it again to turn it off. And what you can do is check your rig to see if uh, it's in a transmit state when you hit test PTT. Um, so that takes, that'll get your rig set up. Next thing you need to do is set up your audio. Um, you'll need a sound card coming in. You need input and output. Again, if you're using a signal link, if you're using any of the other possible devices, you could actually even have your radio directly connected to your computer's input and uh, line in and line out. Those are possibilities. Um, is there people asking questions just out of curiosity? Yeah, I, I put mine in the, uh, in the chat to you personally, but uh, Joe, uh, okay. you and I talked a little bit about split operation and, and fake it. And I know you have time constraints, yes. but if you don't have time, that's a, that's okay. But, sure. And, and actually that's a good point. I do have a note here to bring that up. Um, uh, on the questions guys, uh, my screens are limited on what I can see. So um, if you do have a question, just go ahead and feel free to unmute and say something. Or, or if you want to hold up your hand, I'll try to monitor participants here and we'll, we'll tell Joe about it. Okay, that works too. Okay, uh, split operation. You definitely do run, a, run split uh, in whatever manner you can. If your rig will support it, um, go ahead and click, um, click the rig. You may have to put your rig, you may have to manually put your rig in split mode. Uh, I typically do. The reason you wanna run split is because what's gonna happen is that when the software goes to transmit, it's gonna shift its transmit frequency so that it can try and keep uh, your transmit occurring around 1500 uh, hertz, okay? The middle of the band. Now that means what's gonna happen is, is that if your transmit is actually set towards the lower end of the band, say around 500 hertz, what it's gonna do is that it's gonna use a split frequency of about 1K lower, okay? 500 to 1K lower. Again, if you're at the top of the band, it'll go a little bit higher, or excuse me, sorry, it'll, other way around. But the idea is, is that it does best with the tones and the like when they are around the 1500 hertz mark. So that's why you'd want to run split. It's just better for your trans, your transmit quality is much better. So after we've gotten uh, audio set up, um, reporting uh, these settings, uh, there, the one thing I put in here is to prompt me to log the QSO. What'll happen is that a little message will pop up once it's done and you'll, it'll say, um, do you want to log the QSO? I set that, definitely set that, log the QSO. There is another one that you saw below there, uh, log automatically. I don't use it. Uh, some people like to use it, but personally I don't. I like to see what's going in the log before it's actually done. Then the other thing that we need to do is in the advanced tab, we need to set up for field day. 
So you click that little box that says special operating activity, select a RRL field day, and put in your field day exchange. I plan to run one echo, Virginia. That's simple. Then you're basically done. This is what it'll look like. You'll notice uh, what's gonna happen is that you'll see a little, if you look down at the bottom of the main screen there, sorry, I didn't put a little uh, circle around it. But if you look down near the bottom of the main screen, you'll see there's the red, little red bar and it says field day. It's letting you know it's in field day mode. It also pops up the contest window um, log directory. So you'll see logs of what has been sent of the QSOs that you have made. <clears throat> Joe, where do you, what setting enables split? I didn't see that. Oh, okay. Let's go back up real quick. It's and right here. Mike Ellington had a question. Sure. On the settings window, on the, on the window on the left, um, right above where you see the green test cat button there. Yes. That's split up. That's where you should set the split operation. Okay. Gotcha. So do you have to put your rig in split operation? I, yes, I do. So I just, uh, all I have to do on my rig is push a button, say split. The software will worry about setting the frequencies for VFOB appropriately. Now, now Ed, I, my rig, my FT990, I'm using USB CAT control. And uh, mine actually entered split automatically when I selected rig. Okay. So That's every radio, might, every rig might be a little different when you got to enable it or not on the rig. Okay. You may just have to play with it. And then Mike Ellington had a question. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I want to know um, for the logging, what actually prompts that uh, logging? What prompts the prompt? Is it uh, full contact? So, for example, if you were to uh, make contact and you got an answer, but you didn't go through the list. Uh, when you send your 73, that's when it's going to prompt you to log it, regardless of whether you've received a 73 from the other person. Okay, perfect. And so sometimes you may have to play with it. For example, a lot of times I'll send a Roger Roger 73 and I'll get the prompt to log it. I'll log it. And then what happens is that he has actually hasn't heard my Roger Roger 73. So his previous message has, he's still transmitting his previous message. So I have to go back and manually hit it to resend the Roger Roger 73. I'll show you where that is in just, uh, let me get down to a screen where we can see the, uh, right here. If you look over under the um, generated standard messages towards the bottom of the main screen that's on the left there, what happens is that you'll see a button uh, up here. There's a column there that says next. That's going to tell you what the next message is that it, you're going to be sending. So when you're, when it's auto sequencing, it's generally going to go from the Roger to, or the Roger Roger 73 down to CQ. So if he has not sent, if he hasn't heard my Roger Roger 73, which means I've heard everything you've got, I'm saying goodbye. If he hasn't heard that, he's going to retransmit his message saying, by the way, I got your information. Here's my information please confirm it. So I have to go back and hit the button next to the Roger Roger 73 for him and hit transmit enable. So you're going to have to play with it some um, in order to uh, get used to it. Um, people understand mistakes happen and believe me that when you're going through this, uh, you're going to sometimes uh, not respond to a person when you think you should, when he's expecting it but they generally will stick with it and keep talking to you for a while. So JT alert, um, this is what handles actually taking the messages from WSJTX and feeding them to the logger. Again, it's another program that's easy to set up. Uh, for this, you just uh, go to the settings and select manage settings or press the F11 key. 
and you'll get a window that looks like this. So you want to go down and basically you can leave everything to almost everything default. The only thing you generally have to change here is the logging. We need to enable it. So select that, then go down to uh, AC log and select that. And you'll get a window that shows this, uh, that you'll see what you get here. And then what you want to do is select enable AC logging. Okay. This is the uh, logging in which this is what allows it to talk to the field day software that I'm using. If you're using a different logger, you can see that there's a number of options there. You've got uh, DX Lab, you've got HRD, you've got Log for Old Men. So you've got different options. And then for the um, <clears throat> field day software that we typically use, hit, uh, be sure to hit Remote Networked PC. Uh, you want to do that because you enabled the other side of it on the logging software earlier. Uh, make sure the port is still at 1100. Uh, it should come up with the default address of your local machine 127001. The other critical one is this. You need to point it to the uh, log database. The typical location for it is the documents of FirmTech, N3, FJP, uh, ARRL, field day, log data. That's the typical location. If you're not sure, uh, there is a button in the logging software for N3 uh, J FJP that will tell you where the log data is. And then make sure you set the appropriate log type. Uh, the only other thing that you really need to make sure of when you are playing with this is go to the sound card make sure that it does not want to use the same sound card that is talking to your rig. Generally, you want this one to be whatever talks to you through your speakers, uh, because there's an option with JT Alert to do voice notifications. I typically turn that off, but you do need this thing to be pointed to a sound device other than your rig. Otherwise, it could end up playing those, um, those messages out your radio, which you may not want. Uh, the other thing to do, I go ahead and put in my call sign station location. That's just uh, for, its, for its ability to sit there and give you information about the other, uh, the other contact. Not really necessary, but you can go, I go ahead and do that. So we're all set up. Now we're ready to run it. Uh, so what'll happen is that we'll go through. Um, once we get done with the contact, uh, this is the message that you'll, this is the, um, uh, when you're done and you've done the 73, this is the prompt that you get for logging the queue cell. Okay. So what it's gonna show is the start time, who you talk to, mode, ban, uh, as well as the exchange sent and received. I kind of like to look at it and make sure it's correct. Once you hit OK, it's going to log it. Uh, if you notice, it'll also show up in the contest log. And then, boom, it's going to show up in your uh, log software. Easy peasy. I know it sounds like a lot of steps, but most of them are one step at a time and you will get there. Uh, I have some operational um, tips if you, we can go through. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that you wanna do is on your audio input level, if you can control the level of the audio coming into your computer, and generally you can either do that at the radio, at your sound card, or even in the sound mixer that's on your computer, whether it be Windows or Linux or, Linux or Mac OS, there's generally a way to do it. And so you wanna get that set um, so that your, the, uh, 
the green bar that's over here on the uh, right hand side, uh, excuse me, left hand side of the main panel, uh, you'll see that little uh, receiving uh, green bar on the left hand side. Generally, you want that down around 30, 30 dB when there's nothing on the band. You definitely want to make sure this never goes into the red. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to overdrive the, um, the software and you're going to miss a lot of decodes. Uh, the other thing that you want to do is look at um, the power output uh, from, uh, from WSJTX, the audio level for that. That's over there all the way on the right-hand side. It's that uh, blue slider bar that says PWR. I know it says power, but what it's doing is it's just driving the audio level. Uh, for example, on my rig, place that you want that set generally is just shy of where your, a your ALC starts to kick in. Um, so on my K3, they give you a specific uh, place on the, bar, on the bar graph there. They say you want four bars solid and one bar just flickering. And you can test that by just hitting that tune button in the upper uh, right-hand corner there. And it will just transmit a, uh, a two-tone so that you can set your ALC appropriately. Uh, you can, if you can set your power level on your uh, machine, on your rig to zero, you won't be transmitting everything and annoying everybody or send it into a dummy load. But want to get your audio going out set so that you're just shy of the ALC kicking in. The other thing on the um, receive audio that I didn't mention is that I, for example, with my K3, I've got to have the AGC turned on. Um, and I think most people actually find that and that's that that is true that they'll want their AGC on. Uh, I run it with a slow in the slow setting and does very well on um, decoding. If I turn the AGC off, I have found that WSJTX will miss a lot of decodes. Um, search and pounce, uh, the CQ will. Oh, that's the other operational item. Uh, if you look in the upper left hand corner, there's an item that says CQ only. Okay. Uh, what that does is that um, it will only on the receive side, or the receive side of the band, the band activity, you select that, it's only going to show you CQs. So if you're running search and pounce, that's generally a good thing to do because you may not be interested in everybody else just yet. Uh, but in, if there's a lot of people calling CQ and there's just a lot of activity, it can kind of declutter that. The other thing that you want to play with here, you definitely, um, what I do operationally is uh, when I'm running, um, I will find a blank spot on the band and set my transmit frequency for there. Um, let me see. Oh, I had these nice and circled. <laughs> anyway, uh, let me come back to that on the whole transmit frequency. So we've talked about this, the green bar, the receive side, you need this to be in the green. We've talked about that. The tune will let you do that. Uh, auto sequencing, I definitely select that. Uh, what that does is that's going to have the software move from one message to the next automatically. This way, you're not having to click that next button and hit transmit or something like that. You're just, uh, the software can handle it. You only have about, there's about, 50, each transmit section is 15 seconds. Of actual transmit time, I think it's 13.7. So there's about 1.3 seconds there where you would have to be making decisions about what's the next message to transmit. This is where the auto sequencing really does help. Call first um, is very useful uh, when you're running, uh, when you're CQing, when you're, when you're in run mode and you get four people respond to you. So which one is it gonna pick? Well, the first one at D when call first is selected it's going to pick the first one it decodes and answer him. After that, 
and you've done the 73 for that, it's up to you to hit the next one, decide who's next. And what I usually do is try and keep an idea of who answered me the, or who answered my original CQ or who's the oldest one in that queue. You kind of just got to watch that receive side and see who's been sending it. Um, you do this a couple of times and you'll get the feel for it. Uh, it's really not that daunting. And sometimes people will give up before you have a chance to get around to them. That's okay. It's their loss. Hold frequency. Um, this I will typically use. Like I said, what I will do is that I will find a space in the band uh, that looks clear. Uh, for example, if you look right now on the right hand side of the screen, towards the top of the waterfall, you see a little uh, uh, red bar and a um, and green bar uh, at the top of the band. That means my transmit and receive frequencies are in the same place uh, right now. And actually it's a busy place. So what I will do is I will try and find an empty spot in the band by just looking at it and then set my transmit frequency to it. Well, that one over there uh, near 2000 Hertz looks kind of empty. So what I'll do is I will hit, I will put my cursor over there and hit, I think it's shift, shift click. And that sets my transmit frequency. And then I'll hold my transmit frequency there, whether I'm CQing or answering somebody else even if they're somewhere else on the band, uh, the software will automatically sh uh, shift your receive to whoever you're answering. Um, let's see, I think that's about all that I had right now. Is there any questions? I'm sure there are a lot. Hey, Joe. Yes, sir. Uh with you mentioned standard messages, I mean, is this something you've already pre-entered into the software? Are you canned messages or what? Good, good question. Uh, the software, the the protocol uh, for using FT8 has a standard set of canned messages, which generally goes along the lines of somebody does a CQ that includes their call sign in their grid. Right. When um, when you double click on them, on their um, call sign, when you wanna answer them, the software will automatically generate those messages for you. So your, your answer to them would be generally be their call sign, your call sign, and your grid. Mm -hmm. However, when you're in FT, uh, doing field day, what it's going to answer with is, um, it's gonna send his call sign, your call sign, and your exchange. So for example, you will see that if you look on the uh, left-hand side there under generate standard messages, that column there, the next message, the first message that I'll be, be sending is my call sign, or excuse me, his call sign, my call sign, and my exchange. Because we're not exchanging grid information here and during field day. During a normal uh, outside of field, field day, you would, be, that would be what you'd be using instead of the field day 1E Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so these messages are automatically generated. You can add free messages um, by, um, there's a window there. If you, I think it's either number two or three, those tabs, there's a place where you can put in a free message. You're limited to uh, 13 characters. Okay, so it's not conversational, it's strictly contact. 